Thanks everybody for taking the time to come to our talk about multi-network, a new level of cluster multi-tenancy. Today, what we're going to look at is first of all, what is Kubernetes native multi-networking? And then we're gonna dig into some of the use cases about how you would get multi-networking going. Mache is gonna take you through a user journey. We're gonna get down to some of the brass tacks and show you exactly what it looks like when from a user perspective, you're setting up multi-networking on some pods. We're gonna talk a little bit about some of the ancillary pieces that are involved in this, as well as some of the history behind it, like what predates the Kubernetes native multi-networking. And then we are gonna invite you to get involved. I am Doug Smith. I am a Red Hatter um, who's an OpenShift uh, engineer, and I have been involved in uh, multi-networking with Kubernetes for some time, and I'm particularly interested in telco and performance networking use cases. And I'm joined today by Maciej. Hi, my name is Maciej, and I am a software engineer at Google working in the GKE Anthos networking team. So what exactly is multi-networking? Today, if you spin up Kubernetes and you spin up a pod and you go and exec into that pod and you do IPA, you are going to see a pod with a single network interface outside of the loopback, ETH0. So you see that up on the top and then down at the bottom, you see that that pod via ETH0 has connectivity to all of the other pods in that network. And that's kind of a Kubernetes promise that you get. And then you would take and you would limit that um, connectivity using network policy. But you have to ask yourself, what if that single interface just isn't enough? So what Kubernetes native multi-networking does is at the most basic level, allows you to spin up a pod with multiple network interfaces so that you can get connectivity to exactly the places that you want it to go in an isolated or performant fashion. And we'll get into all of the different ways you might utilize that. And you might ask yourself, why is it that we are working on this now? Yeah, we are thinking right now that it's about time to talk about and adding multi-networking to Kubernetes as a whole. As a project, it is very stable and uh, adopted very well. We cross the chasm of adoption. And uh, we think that it is the right time to start talking and picking up more complex uh, topics uh, in uh, Kubernetes as a whole, as a project. Um, that's why we are thinking of um, committing time towards that uh, with the very important aspect that any introduced complexity to the whole Kubernetes project is basically a tax paid by all of us. So we need to be careful of how far we are pushing this so that we can live with Kubernetes in, in, in the future. Um, so right now, I want to, uh, we want to show you a few use cases that we come up with our group uh, on uh, what sort of uh, situation do we want to handle with multi-networking. And the first one is the flagship that uh, got all of you interested in this uh, talk is the uh, multi-tenancy. And basically this is a multi-tenancy on a um, networking level. And basically on uh, the, the way you implement it, you can even achieve a <coughs> multi-tenancy on a physical uh, layer, uh, having all your workloads connected to different networks. And in this case, we want to remove any notions of primary or secondary networks. All those networks are equal. So we are envisioning it in such a way that all those networks have the same capabilities uh, that the current today's uh, um, pods have. So there is no differentiation between any of the networks today. Another one of my favorite use cases is for network isolation. Um, 
in a number of there's a number of reasons why you want might want network isolation and for me the two that usually come up first is either for performance or for security and maybe for regulatory compliance so i actually got my start in kubernetes um, from an open source telephony standpoint and when i first started doing it was previous to a kubernetes 1.0 and I would mostly just use host networking for my pods, which totally eliminated the possibility of a multi-tenant um, kind of situation like Mache was talking about. Um, but network isolation is really important from a telephony standpoint. So one thing that you would typically do is you would have a management network, which would be how you kind of interact with your infrastructure. You would have a signaling network, which you would use, for example, to like make your phone ring, right? You get that signal says, go and ring this endpoint. And then lastly, you would have a media network, which you would have the like actual sound of your, um, of your phone call, right? And there's one particularly important reason in a sort of media type of network is that you use UDP traffic. So you want to isolate that so you don't get a kind of UDP congestion. So network isolation for me is a personal and important use case. So other use case we are want to we would like to cover is having ability to connect any of our existing legacy networks that we have in our environments, uh, but not only legacy, but as well, let's say a VPC in the cloud where I have some VMs running on it, to be able to connect them directly to my workloads without any indirections with any proxies or um, any types of nothing in between those. And just like you might have existing networks that you want to connect to, you might also have existing workloads that you want to run in your cloud native environment as you kind of make this journey to cloud native. So you might have workloads that are still virtual machines. And they might be virtual machines for a number of reasons. This might be vendor software that you've already invested in. It's shipped to you as a virtual machine and then you want to go and get this into your cloud native uh, environment. Or it may be that because of resource constraints, you have this legacy software that still runs in this way and it's gonna take you time to refactor it to get that fully containerized. If you're a virtual machine user, hot plugging an interface is something that you would absolutely take for granted that you could do, that you could go and into your management software and say, give me another interface on this machine and point it at this network, for example. We wanted to make sure that that is a um, first class consideration in multi-networking to enable you to be able to, to do that. So one example I would think of is, let's say you have a um, BGP peering situation you have your workload up and running, and instead of shutting that machine down or that pod down, um, you would instead hot plug an interface because BGP peering will take a long time to happen. So if you go and shut that workload entirely down, you kind of lose your state. So in a more stateful scenario, you might want to be able to hot plug an interface. And then another use case where we would like to, for example, introduce some sort of QoS tiers into our cluster, where we would like to connect the different pods uh, into the different uh, types of uh, connections and configure those the direct connections on a per pod level, but simultaneously being able to represent the whole network as one item, that's very important for us. And that might be useful in the future forwarding things where what if we want to then be able to apply a network policy to that specific network. So we'd like to apply it once for the pod network, but then differentiate that network in a various ways. In this case, here I'm showing an example of differentiating the bandwidth limits on each of those connections uh, for each pod, but they're, they're basically that that's boils down to being and being able to parameterize any types of uh, single connection to a pod the way you want it and the way your implementation handles it. <laughs> 
Another use case that we are looking at is for utilizing your performance hardware. So on your on-premise uh, situations or maybe even in your kind of bare metal um, cloud instances that you might have, you may have performance hardware that you want to utilize. This is a particular challenge in this space because something that we need to account for is having workloads being scheduled to the proper node that has the resources available. So something that we, of course, love about Kubernetes is it's an awesome scheduler and it does a good job of getting your workloads to where they need to run and just in time. But when you have a resource constraint as well, you need to give that um, scheduler that awareness of which of these um, hardware resources are available. Even today during the keynote talking about GPUs, there is a mention of device resource allocation. Um, which comes from a history of something we call a device plugin, which was also for GPUs, but in the networking space, we also have hardware considerations, so we wanted to look at this. So this um, diagram demonstrates SROV in particular, where you would have a physical function, which would be like your like physical element of a particular hardware device, and then your VF, your virtual function, which is the like, virtualized slicing of that particular resource. So we wanted to make sure that this is accounted for because in terms of multi-networking, you often want to be able to utilize this investment. So now we want to walk you through a user journey that we envision. A bit of a disclaimer, this is something that we still are in works and discussions with the rest of the community. But this is what we came up with for the last few months with the, our current project for multi-networking in SIG network and what we think to propose to the rest of the community. So the first step is to introduce a new object. Uh, right, we will need to have some sort of generic handle to represent a network, something that we uh, basically take for granted when we create a pod today, it just being handled by our CNI on how to connect a, a network or network to that um, pod. Here we want to have some sort of representation for that network and how the CNI handles it. Uh, this is what we want to introduce is the pod network object that will be very basic and have implementation agnostic um, uh, fields that then can every can pick it up uh, and, and implement. Uh, the first field we want to kind of introduce is just a provider on who's implementing the specific pod network and this gives us ability to create multiple uh, multiple implementers in a single cluster. So that's another capability we want to introduce. And then lastly we want to have a um, parameters reference. So that's a gateway for every implementation out there to introduce their own parameters to the pod network and then introduce whatever they want to do and however they want to implement this. Uh, the next stage is slight changes to the pod. This is a bit controversial, but I think this is not something that we can get away without this. So we would like to create a pod level uh, field with list of pod networks that we would like to attach to. Uh, those are the objects that I mentioned before. And here we would have a list of, uh, ex explicit list of the pod networks uh, that the specific pod has to attach. Uh, here, one important thing is the list is optional. So we want to make sure this is a capability, a feature that is completely backward compatible and doesn't require any um, clusters that don't care about multi-networking to worry about this at all. So we want to introduce a notion of a, something called default pod network. And you can think of a default pod network similar to like a default namespace is today in today's clusters. Basically, it's a pod network that if you don't specify any networks, I will attach to the default pod network. This is the, basically the same concept what we have today. When you bring up a pod, a, a pod, it just connects, it just has some network. And that's the default pod network. That's basically what we are trying to achieve, be, uh, to ensure um, it is uh, backward compatible. And the pod network will behave, the, the default pod network will be auto-populated today in the pod with this, similar to like, let's say, a node name is populated by the scheduler in a pod when you don't specify that. And then we want to get some status of this out of this whole thing. So what we want to do is leverage the pod IPs field that we today have in the pod. Uh, 
there is a one restriction to that field. It, it allows only two IPs in it uh, to be listed. And those IPs has to be from, each has to be from a different IP family, V4 and V6. We, and we, with this, we'd like to just introduce a, a new field to the list called pod network. Basically, then we'd assign the specific IP to a specific pod network. But still, we want to preserve the backward compatibility and slightly change the requirement where it's still just two IPs, uh, one IP per family, but per pod network. That will give us basically the same backward compatibility, but with the ability to expand it to multiple pod networks in a specific pod. And lastly, we want to as well give some uh, status to the pod network itself. Uh, so we want to leverage the standard conditions in the, um, in the object to um, represent what is the state of the object itself. So we want to have a ready conditions, which is a very basic state, whether uh, the, the, the object is cluster-wide ready for us to use. And then additionally, we want to introduce something called PARMS ready. But, and this is an optional uh, implementation-specific condition that will give the implementation ability to control the readiness of the pod network indirectly through that uh, condition. All right, and I would like to talk a little bit about some implementation specifics in this particular case. As Mache mentioned, this specification is totally implementation agnostic. So you can take this structure that we're talking about and you can wire it up any way that you'd like to with any kind of implementation that you would like to. So in this particular case, CNI itself is an implementation detail, right? And in some ways we might take it for granted in Kubernetes that CNI would be how you're gonna plug your network in. And I think in a number of implementations you will still see CNI being involved and CNI is gonna be generally kicked off um, by your runtime. Before I move on to the next slide, I just want to give a very, very, very short history lesson, which was the conversation about multi-networking in Kubernetes has been going on for a long time. And in um, back in KubeCon 2017 in Austin, Texas, uh, we got a good group of people together to talk about, hey, what are we gonna do about having multi-homed pods in Kubernetes. Um, for me, is a really great example of how KubeCon brings people together and gets these conversations going. And we decided we're gonna form a working group, we're gonna figure out a specification for this, and we're gonna eventually look for a common ground home for this particular work. So previous to this, there has been work by the Network Plumbing Working Group to create a custom resource definition called the Network Attachment Definition. And you might be familiar with some of the implementations. Um, I am a maintainer of Multis CNI, so it's the one that I think of first, but it gives you a way to express how you're going to attach multiple interfaces to your pod. So on the left-hand side here, what you're seeing is what, how this would be set up with the network attachment definition and potentially with multi-CNI is you're gonna have a custom resource. So that means it's a like additional extension to the API that you create as a user. And then you're going to say that you want to attach it using an annotation, which um, anyone can use one of those, as opposed to the right-hand side where we're seeing a native object. The pod network would be a native um, component in Kubernetes, like a cron job or a um, network policy, for example. You would have your pod network, right? You wouldn't create a custom resource for it. Now, something that to me is interesting here is because the work for the network attachment definition was done out of tree, it does have, number one, a reliance on CNI. CNI configurations are made with JSON. So something that you're gonna notice here is that you're gonna have a YAML file 
with JSON packed in it. And if you are a developer and you are walking through an object like this and then you have to parse a different format, that is gonna just rub you the wrong way for sure. So something that is going to be quite an advantage from a developer perspective under having the Kubernetes native multi-networking is you're just gonna use client go and you're gonna walk through that object like you would any other object and you're not necessarily gonna have to pull in a library to parse this or roll or God forbid have to roll your own um, way to parse this. So that is gonna be a major advantage and it should make your life a lot better when you're writing something like a controller or an operator to have like a richer, um, way to manage um, networking within your clusters. So the question may be, what exactly will happen with Multis CNI? Well, something that's kind of great about this specification is that one, if you don't care about this specification, you don't actually have to use it. It doesn't preclude you from using everything in a totally backwards compatible way. So this doesn't preclude you from an investment that you might have in using the um, network attachment definition. That being said, um, as the previous slide illustrates, I think that there's a lot of advantages that we can get out of having this be in tree. Um, one of the things we haven't quite touched on um, in a big way right now is services, right? That's a real challenge. So I'm working with the Network Plumbing Working Group to try to figure out, you know, what's our North Star? How are we going to move forward um, as a group? And part of that story of what our North Star is, is what happens with our container runtimes. Um, we've been lucky enough to have some contributions from uh, Mike Zappa and Peter White from Microsoft. Um, and one of the things that's being looked at is what needs to happen with our container runtime. So there's a lot going on in this slide. It shows you a lot of the life cycle of what happens in um, uh, the CRI. Um, however, take a look at the left-hand side with the red boxes is kind of the new fields that we need to pass both to and from um, the container runtime, which might also execute CNI. Um, so for example, in a multi-CNI scenario, we have to deal with some inefficiencies because we don't have this, right? We have to query the Kubernetes API to figure stuff out where this could happen natively, and we can get the kind of information and back that we need for the stuff like Mache was showing with the status. So. Um, this is just a proposal um, disclaimer, um, but really looking forward to see what happens next with the container runtimes. All right, and now I'm going to ask you all to get involved. But before we're gonna do that, I just wanted to show you where we are today. So as you've seen, we showed you some use cases. There's something that we defined and we have a few more of them than what we just showed you. And out of those use cases, we managed to create and define requirements. Uh, there came up to be quite few of them, and as a whole, it's becoming a big project to kind of handle. So what we did, we divided the requirements into phases. So we created currently four phases, and we managed to define the first phase. So we have defined the API that we want to create, add, and how it's gonna basically interact with pod and some basic interactions with scheduler as well. Uh, right now, for the next uh, Kubernetes release, we're trying to get that uh, merged and create an implementation for that in upstream Kubernetes. Uh, our following phases will be to kind of uh, build on top of that. We want to add more, uh, we want to add some RBAC uh, to this whole thing. We want to in enhance a scheduler to be able to uh, introduce a selective availability of that, uh, identify selective availability of the pod network across nodes. Then a next phase, which be quite tricky because this is where we want to finally tackle services and not, not network policies and how we handle that with multi-networking. And then lastly, this is where we want to look at some extended capabilities like hot plugin ability. So uh, please help us with defining all those.
Currently, we have a Slack channel, SIG Network, multi-networking. So all welcome, and please help us define this whole uh, big project and make it more robust and be able to uh, it working, be it being able to work for every all of and uh, every one of us. We meet weekly on Wednesdays in Pacific time zone. Uh, there is a meeting doc. This QR code will get you to it. Uh, where you're going to have all the other links uh, related to multi-networking. And lastly, this is our PR for the CAP. Uh, you will see uh, all what, I, we, what we talked about here in this talk and more. Um, we need your all feedback about this to get this much better. All right, thank you very much. And I think that's, that's all we wanted to talk. Yeah. I think we have a few more minutes. If are there any questions, there is a mic out there. Oh, is it on? It's not on. Can we? Uh, yes, hello. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the use case of uh, connecting to other applications that are running on premise from within pods. And uh, our application is kind of, it has a distributed nature with many components running on different platforms, different architectures. And uh, they kind of, they need this ability to cross connect uh, freely, basically, kind of operate on an open network. So, does this uh, have any provisions for such connectivity, basically from outside the cluster to the pods inside the cluster, without needing to kind of defining services or having like some uh, separate agents, proxies to facilitate that? Yeah, definitely. Keep in mind, this is an API definition, right? So, yeah. it all boils down how your implementation handles the whole connectivity, right? So it's the whole API that we presented here does not introduce the implementation itself. That's something that we need to keep in mind, right? So your use case definitely can be handled by the implementation that you would currently use probably and just be adapted to the new APIs. So basically you're talking about like a custom network plugin or yeah, that, probably, that adheres yeah, yeah. to like these new APIs and yeah, CMS. exactly. Okay, I see. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Can you pass the mic to yeah, your sure. next person? Thank you. So I know you said that the future of what this looks like in container runtimes is kind of TBD. Um, what do you think that looks like as far as I'm looking at a host and I'm looking at the containers and processes running on that host? And today when I look at that, I have a network namespace for a process in the container. What do you think that looks like in the future with multi-network? Sure. Um, I think that that will largely remain the same. So I think that you're going to see in terms of like the container architecture of the pod, you're still going to see that infra um, sandbox. You're still going to see your um, network namespace. I think that that should stay the same. But what you will likely see is if you were to look at that um, sandbox container that will have multiple networks in it and that will be shared across the containers within that pod um, so just like um, well actually now i'm questioning myself but i would think that um, for storage like a volume mount you could have volume mounts that are shared across the containers in a pod but that might also be isolated but um, that should that should share so like uh, you would have you have a pod, you have two processes running it and two containers. Both of those containers should see the network interfaces in at that layer. But what I am hopeful that we wind up seeing is that the um, container runtimes themselves get um, more capability to actually do some of the work that, say, multi-CNI does today. 
and the ability to make multiple invocations of CNI. So I'm kind of hoping to see something like that. Is that helpful? Yeah, so it sounds like in terms of what I'm actually seeing on the host, I'll still have one process, well, maybe multiple processes with one namespace, but there'll be multiple interfaces in that namespace. You got it, yeah, okay. absolutely. So you're gonna have that, yeah, one process per container, maybe multiple containers per pod, and then that infra, you got it. Thank you. Great presentation. Um, how does this uh, interact with the gateway API? So this is something that's one of the integration points that we definitely have, similar to what we are thinking of services and network policies, gateway will be the next step. And it's, there are some ideas in my head, at least on how that look like. Uh, one of the ideas and just throwing that in that a, a, a gateway, a service can be done per network, which is keeps it then very simple, especially a single gateway or service is assigned to a network and that's it. That keeps us simple. Today, it's all, everything is assigned to default network, pod network, in the future we can have those assigned to various different network, pod networks. Uh, is pod network a cluster level resource or a namespace? It's a uh, cluster level namespace. Yeah, that's what we're thinking, yes. Right. Would it be possible to have per namespace pod networks? Or is that kind of beyond the use cases that were considered? I think we would have to talk probably in detail on why, because we would consider this as a core object, like node, right? Keep, keep, keep in mind, node, why would you want to have a pod network on a namespace? And there needs to be some use case and discussion on why would you want to have that, right? I would assume. But right now we are thinking it's cluster, cluster wide object. All right, thank you. Uh, would there be a limitation on the number of interfaces each pod can have? So could you repeat the question, sorry? Uh, like, would there be a limitation or, I mean, how many interfaces maximum can we have? Oh, okay, I see. Uh, I don't think it's, we wouldn't uh, impose any limitation. It will be up to the implementation and, and the node probably what they can handle, right? And Again, up to implementation. If there is a, keep in mind, depending on what you have in your path of configuring this, right? Uh, maybe CRI will be in your path and that will have some limitations. From the point of view of our API, it's, it, it, it is, there is no limit. We don't, we don't impose, from, the, from today, we don't impose any limits, no. Thank you. This is actually somewhat related to the uh, uh, network namespace question, but from a different perspective. Um, I've used the host network CNI plugin to a host device to move a device into the namespace of a pod. This has one interesting limitation, which is a device on Linux can be in exactly one namespace at a time. It moves it out of the host. Um, so this is a minor issue if you actually truly want that device in multiple namespaces, like like host network actually does, or host device host network does, because you multiple pods are truly in the host network namespace. Is there any idea that? Um, and the other issue is yeah pods correspond to network namespaces. You get exactly one. So is there any idea that you could join an existing network namespace or anything in that space? Or is this truly separate from that? This is like the CNI plugins and Multis today. Um, great question. I um, host device CNI is near and dear to me. I know it well and I have used it. Um, that's an interesting challenge and one of my own challenges with it is also um, like scheduler wise right so like if you like I guess the example I would give would be like okay um, telco ran lab and you have like a couple lab machines that have like a USB device to like emulate your radio network and you want to move that device into your pod and so you use uh, uh, host device CNI for it. But how do you get that pod onto the right box? Um, that has been my challenge. But generally the answer that most people would usually give for that is that you would want to use a resource that is divisible like a SRIOV. So yeah. like, and like the problem is I was trying to do promiscuous build on the dicks that it was SRIOV was in theory it may still work, but that's why I was trying to actually use host device as opposed to a VF. Yeah, and I <laughs> totally feel your pain there because SRLV is a pain and host device can be like an easy answer for like 
give me this it device. It might still work, this, and that's what I'm going to try to do. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have like an awesome answer for you, but I love the question for sure. Um, oh, last question. All right, great talk, guys. Um, two questions. First, you showed the um, the pod network object being a V1 API. Would it start as a V1 alpha? Yeah, definitely. We just showed what. <laughs> okay, yeah. We, uh, we, we, we showed what we would imagine in the future V1, but definitely it will have to start out as a V1 alpha, definitely. That just, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. And then the second question is, would this introduce a V2 pod spec? Or would it be compliant uh, within the... There was some discussion yesterday about it. Someone said that <laughs> I don't think that's possible. Uh, we don't know yet. I don't think we would want to do it. I, I, to be honest, I don't know. This is something that, as I mentioned, is, has to be discussed with the community and see where we go with there. Yeah. I think it's a great path and great discussion. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. And uh, if you want to talk more, just grab us after this talk or anytime. Uh, yep. Thank you all for coming.